Morning, everyone. Welcome to FBC Midtown Collective. I'm the senior pastor, the Reverend Lamar J. Pringle, and I am so excited that you've welcomed me back into your house and your and your computer and your iPad phone or whatever you're watching this on, because clearly you're not here yet. But we're getting on that. We're working on that. So let's get ready. I'm ready. I'm so excited to share with you this next message on Church Hurt No More, part three, where we're going to talk about innovative forgiveness. You're going to like, what? We're going to, yeah, we're going to innovate forgiveness. So let's get the music going. It should be starting. Welcome to the collective brought to you by FBC Sacramento, where we've been serving Northern California for over 170 years. I am the senior pastor, the Reverend Lamar J. Pringle, and this message is a call to action. Who we are as a community, a body of believers, so different yet united together in Christ on common grounds. I hope while you're listening to this message that your mind and your heart will be ready to receive God's abundant blessings in your life throughout the year. There are jewels tucked in each sermon to help you utilize God's Word so that you will grow to understand yourself more, trust God more, and prayerfully join a community that will teach and encourage you how to reap God's greatest harvest for you every year. Enjoy today's message that will prepare you for each and every season. Let us pray. Now, Eternal God, we come to you in the matchless name of Jesus. Lord, as I always ask, I ask as we approach the moment of preaching, that you would move me out of the way, that your words would come forth with dignity, with clarity, with encouragement, that might the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is good and all the time. Yes. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome. Welcome to part three, Innovative Forgiveness. I am the senior pastor here at Midtown Collective, the First Baptist Church of Sacramento. Um, I won't always be saying them back and forth, but I'm the senior pastor, the Reverend Lamar J. Pringle, and it is an honor and a privilege to share with you God's living word with God's amazing people. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the release of resentment or anger. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to reconciliate. One doesn't have to return to the same relationship or accept the same harmful behaviors from an offender. Forgiveness is vitally important for the mental health of those who have been victimized. And you know I love some mental healthiness and making sure that we are a blessing to the mind so we can be a blessing to the body. In this sermonic presentation, you're going to hear what forgiveness really is, how to forgive so that you can actually hear from God, how to forgive to understand your prayers, how to utilize the power that is living on the inside of you. You remember power and words. Why did you seek forgiveness in the first place? I hope and pray some of these questions, thoughts, concerns will be answered in this sermonic presentation. What does forgiveness mean to you? letting it go, pardoning, to exonerate. Forgiveness can be meaningful or meaningless. I I guess it's opposed on what angle or vantage point you're at. I mean, it's one thing if you need to be forgiven versus if you need to forgive someone who's hurt you. It is such a strange dilemma to end up in when you are seeking to be forgiven. You will seek forgiveness and you will want it right now. You want the person, the situation, the groups, the organization. They must give you their time. They must listen to you. They must acknowledge and believe in your plea or pardon, believe that you are indeed truly sorry. But uh, when it's up to you to forgive another, whoa, Nelly! Shout out to the voice of college football of my youth, Keith Jackson. Forgiveness is a critical concept to grasp. When you seek forgiveness, when you offer to yourself, to God, to your family, to those you've hurt, and to those that have hurt you, when you offer to come to grips with that, it's going to feel like holding on to a hot potato. Now, forgiveness in itself isn't much of a problem to grasp. You get it. You understand it. But you don't always use it. Be honest. You don't. For instance, I met my biological father when I was around 11 or 12 years old. And me and my dad did not have the greatest relationship. I mean, he missed out on some critical years of my upbringing. But as I entered into high school, I tried to get to know him. And we had some amazing conversations that I will forever treasure. 
but I wanted more. I wanted more from him. I wanted what he didn't know how to give. Could he have loved me better? Yes, absolutely. But at the time, it just fueled the anger inside of me. And anger left unchecked will distort the image of anything it looks at. You see, as a young man, I was mad and angry all the time. But what I discovered later on, it was this. I was actually more hurt than I was anything else. I was more hurt and sad than angry. You know, I I thought anger was the boulder that stood blocking my forgiveness for this man that didn't express his love for me, but it indeed, it was my deep hurt. I discovered that being hurt was directly contributing to my avoidance of forgiving and forgiveness as a whole. So I began investing and learning how to address the hurt over the anger. The hurt needed healed. Jesus can do that because my anger is pretty much inconsolable or is it unconsolable? I believe they mean actually the same thing. If I'm wrong, email me, let me know, write it in the comments. I don't know if it's inconsolable, unconsolable. I think they're both. That's fine. Okay, we're good. We're good. Let's move on. Church hurt no more. For three weeks, I have been giving you tools for you to put inside your toolbox, challenging you to be amongst diversity for the purpose of unity, learning, growing your own creativity and innovation. I've taught you and shared with you about repentance, which is just changing your attitude or attitudes. You know if you have more than one and behaviors. If you purposely place yourself in situations that are diverse, miracles can happen. It happened on the day of Pentecost. Remember that a team of only like minded people, it will lull the brain into a state of complacency diminishing performance and discouraging the chances of innovation and flow. That's what happens when we're just all the same. We all begin to think the same. And so we don't make changes and we stop thinking about everyone else or what it was like before we had it. We have to be diverse to make sure we include everybody. I have spent the better part of this summer talking with many former church members in our community and neighborhood and listening to their stories, hearing their trauma, hearing their pain, and hearing their hurt and their anger. And anger and hurt was soaked and saturated throughout their stories, and rightfully so. I grow, and I weep, and I pray, and I listen some more. My heart breaks when I hear how the words, the life and ministry of my super holy hero, Jesus, has been used as a weapon to hurt people. Listening to spirit, to their spirit and their heartbrokenness. Listening to people share that, share those stories of being kicked out of the church for being who they are, going through what they went through. But in these various stories, there is a connection that begins to heal wounds. And it's called listening. It's called empathizing. And it's called loving. We are racially different, clearly theologically different on some on some variances, socially different, economically different, culturally different, and politically different. Yet here we are, not so different after all. We really do want similar things out of this life. We want more peace. We want more harmony. We want more love. We might differ on a couple of these. You, may, you might want to replace love with respect or peace with humor if you actually know how to tell a joke. But... Yet look at harmony. Harmony is a desired outcome because the chords are all different. It's like strumming a guitar. Even if you don't know how to play guitar, if you strum longer than about five minutes, I was about to start rocking an air guitar. If you strum for longer than five minutes, you will find a few chords that sound pretty decent when you strum the right ones in harmony with each other. Harmony means that we are working together, even though we are different. When there is harmony, it sounds beautiful, depending on who's playing. Rocking an air guitar again. Here's a couple simple truths on forgiveness. In Colossians 3.13, it says this, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive 
as the Lord forgave you. Give grace is what forgiveness means. And this and that's what it's describing. God gives us grace. Offer it to others. Simple enough. But it's the hang-up that some of us and I previously used to have on grace. What am I supposed to give? Grace? But, but they hurt me. I've heard the stories. Why would I give grace? Well, hang in there. We will get there and unpack this. And here's the why. Because spoiler alert for the end of the sermon, forgiveness releases us from the weight and the hurt of anger. The more we practice, the lighter the load becomes. It releases it. Not all the way, depending on how deep it is. Number two, the second uh, simple truth that the Bible talks about that I want to share with you. Psalm 130.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Wow. The verb or action word of forgiveness is a word that describes God verbing away our hurts, our pains, and anger, which means verbing. What I mean is that he's removing, separating, picking up, and moving the things we've done wrong. He moves them that far away. Now let's just jump or walk or just listen. We're going to get right into the next. We're going to get right into the passage. This is Acts 3, 1 through 5, the message version. He's crippled and a beggar is how this is labeled and titled in in the Bible. One day at three o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John were on their way into the temple for a prayer meeting. At the same time, there was a man crippled from birth being carried up. And every day he was sat down at the temple gate the one named Beautiful, to beg from those that were going in to the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter into the temple, he asked for a handout. Peter, with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye and said, look here. The man looked up, expecting to get something from them. We're going to stop, teach, break it on down. On the surface, this passage is devoid of the term or word forgiveness. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Esther. Hopefully you had. But if you have, then you might notice this. The name God is not written at all in the book of Esther. But if you read it, you can see that God's in it. Now, rabbis understood that that any time God's name is mentioned in Scripture, it shows that at that moment, God revealed self to those in the story. It was right at that moment. They knew who God was. In the book of Esther, God is only hinted at. But I can assure you, God is saturated throughout the entire book, through the highs and the lows of the story. The reason I give you this little, you know, tidbit is it was upon it was upon us to delve more deeply into these events and to realize that even when you can't see God or hear God, guess what? God is still present. God is still there. Why would God be quiet? I imagine God might be quiet because he doesn't want to talk over you, or maybe because God is waiting for you to finally start talking. Pay attention to what's happening in this story. We have a man that we wouldn't even use that term or that, it, it, that would be, you know, um, a slur in, this, in our time. We don't call people crippled or beggars, but no matter which way you slice it, in the Greek language, it is pretty straightforward. This man was labeled the dude that can't walk. He cannot be much more harsh than that. That was what he was labeled, what people knew him as. He was picked up by Uber Carry, and every day he sat down near the gate to the church and begged from those going in. He begged before they went in, probably because they wouldn't had much coin left after they departed. But begging is depicted as this man asking for a gift from everyone that enters into the church. Can you imagine? Man, please, before you go into the church, can I, can I have a gift? Not looking at them. Before we get to forgiveness, let's stay here and open up church hurt. His expectations hint to his plan and his hurt. In verse 5, you can read that the man with no name in Scripture asked constantly and never made eye contact with anyone while asking. Clearly, very few people had even probably ever addressed him. But when he heard, looky here, he did exactly what he heard. 
expecting something great in return. However, his ask and what he was thinking was about to be supercharged with exceeding and abundant blessings. Let me tell you a story that I feel like matches what's going on in this story. A friend of mine was describing his pain of how he had, hadn't stepped foot into a church for almost 20 years. It was when he came out as a gay man, it was already after the countless amounts of scorn and abuse at the hands of leaders inside the church. He was professed atheist at this time, which is odd because he and I are friends and he always show up. And I love how some of my friends um, end up having these really deep conversations with me and I'm a pastor. But everybody's searching for something. His mother had passed tragically a few years ago and he began soul searching. His mother went to church and she was a member. She was on the Usher board, the Usher. I think they called it Usher board then. That she was a deaconess and a church mother with the big old hat. When she had passed, he began driving by churches, but he couldn't muster up the strength to go in. He even asked a couple of his Christian friends, he's an atheist by the way, if they could go, but he was refused. He just refused to go in. He would either sit in the car or get out and walk around and go grab some coffee and hang out outside the church. He would describe the deep pain of loving God, but never feel accepted, never feeling loved. He once told me that there were many nights that he prayed. He said, Lamar, I prayed plenty of nights not to be gay. I prayed like everyone else. I, 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 wanted, I prayed that I'd be like everyone else. I, I prayed to die. I wanted to disappear. He told me that he felt like God, he knows that God is omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, but God's only mistake in this world was creating him. You see, church hurt happens when we become the gatekeepers to the access of God. If you need to drink from my fountain of life and joy and redemption and restoration and reconciliation, the way I interpret this, never said, could you, how I'm standing in the way or how can I help? So one of these Sunday, one of those Sundays, my friend went out for coffee and he came back to the church. This time he was going to listen to the music on the outside of the church, but he wasn't going in. An older gentleman walked out and said hello and greeted him and said hi. The older gent stated that he had seen the young man standing outside the church a few Sundays and decided to ask him if he needed anything. My friend, as he recounts the story, says he hesitated to ask a question, thinking, I'm not going to ask anything. And then he mustered up the strength and said, yes, can I ask you a question? Absolutely, the older man says. He says, well, do you think God forgives everything. The older gentleman pauses before he gives his answer. Now I'm going to pause real quick. I'm going to jump into Acts 3, 6 and 8. Now don't worry, we'll get back to that story. Acts 3, 6 through 8. Peter says this, I don't have a nickel to my name, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk he grabbed him by the right hand and pulled him up, and in an instant, his feet and ankles became firm. He jumped to his feet, and he began walking. I'm walking on sunshine. No, no? Okay, that's fine. But he was walking. Belief and forgiveness. Forgiveness, remember, is the release of resentment or anger. Forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation. Again, one doesn't have to return back to the same relationship to accept the same harmful behaviors from the offender. The man didn't, was not, ha is not required to, to have to go back to sitting right where he was now that he's up and walking. In this moment, in this moment, there was a release of resentment. There had to have been a release of anger. There had to have been a release of hopelessness, guilt, shame, and any negative thought or feeling this man was going through. You see, he was expecting something. He was expecting maybe change. That's why I didn't look. A little change. Give me some change. He was expecting maybe a piece of bread. He was expecting maybe to be ignored or spat on, yelled at, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they yelled at blind Bartimaeus. They yelled at him to shut it down, even though the man's sight was on the line. So you can use your creative mind to imagine the words and the hatred this man must have encountered and endured every day sitting at the temple gate. But God had other plans. This man was expected. He was expecting something. The before mentioned responses, but he received a look at me. He received a look at me when he was only expecting maybe bread or a coin or lint or scorn. 
But God had other plans. This man was expecting just the bread, the crumbs, a curse or a scorn. But he received a look at me, which is implying, let's connect. Look at each other. Let's have respect for each other. Peter says, hey, I don't have no money on me. You know, I'm fresh out. I got a checking and a savings. It takes two business. Anyway, I don't have any money on me. I actually showed up here just to see God do something amazing. So here in the power of the name of our Savior, come in with us. And, 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 and that's grabbing him by the right hand, pulling him up to his, his feet feels like. That's what it looks like to me. That's what it sounds like to me. How many times did the man have his promises or hopes or wishes shattered and damaged? How many more painful and hurtful words would he have to endure? But this day, in this time, he had something powerful behind his eyes. The Bible describes it as expectation. He expected to receive something because he was addressed. Don't let this passage only allow you to read this as if expectations are wrong or inherently wrong. He looked up because they addressed him. That was like holding on to a lotto ticket and hearing all the numbers called and you're one, you're one away and you're so... Wait a minute, I, I wouldn't know what that is. I just watched it on YouTube, so it's all good. His expectations is the Greek word pradaskaeo, which means to look forward to. You wouldn't look up to look forward to a curse. When he heard, looky here, he knew and felt something great was about to happen. It's in that very moment he experienced God. And when you experience God, it is belief and forgiveness at work on the inside. This man had to release any resentment, anger that he held inside. And how do I know this? We all have it inside of us. I've been called names. I've been told to stop asking questions. And although I've never been, quote, unquote, air quotes and all that stuff called crippled or labeled a beggar, I can relate to the metamorphosis that is happening in this man when he's receiving a gift. After the older gentleman paused to give this young, my friend, wise counsel in this story, he said, young man, what a great question. Does God forgive everything? The older gentleman says this in response. Well, God just might if you learn to. My friend, all of a sudden it struck him, maybe if I just forgive. So my friend went inside and he couldn't stop dancing. He couldn't stop singing. He enjoyed himself so much that he keeps going to this day. Now I know some of y'all are so religiously nosy in CSI, you might be asking about his life and love, his sin, et cetera, et cetera. But let me finish this passage and I'll wrap all of this up. Finally, Acts 3, 8 through 11. Or uh, I might just, yeah, I'll use 11. I'll use 11. The man went into the temple with them, walking back and forth. He was dancing and he was praising God. Everybody there saw him walking around and praising God. They recognized him as the one who sat begging at the temple's gate. You know, the one called beautiful. And they kept rubbing their eyes, astonished, scarcely believing what they were actually seeing. The man threw his arms around Peter and John, all ecstatic. All the people ran up to where they were at Solomon's porch to see it for themselves. But wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. Now, I need to know about your friend. Was, he, was this man a sinner? Was the man in the story a sinner? The man was walking. He was dancing. He was leaping. He was praising God. Everyone seen it. Everyone seen it. They knew it. They knew it was the man that was carried there. And he never made eye contact, only asking for a gift. They're rubbing their eyes, getting all their eye crossed out. They're getting in a group dis disbelief. The man threw his arms around Peter and John so happy he could barely contain it. I mean, he was so excited. He couldn't hide it. This man was a sinner. How do I know? Because we all are. We all walk away from our callings and purposes. We all fail repeatedly in viewing ourselves in the beautiful light that God sees us. We all sell ourselves short, but this man's sin wasn't even mentioned and yet he danced, he shouted, he sang, and he didn't even need to ask them for a thing. Is the miracle really about him being crippled? Or was it that a man that only asked for gifts, gifts started giving them? His dance, his praise was a gift to all that seen him. It set up later events in the, in the temple where all the people were told that they were already forgiven. So it should strengthen your ability to repent. You see, your inability to change your attitudes or your behavior 
it's tied together to the notion that you won't release something, some resentment. Maybe it's some anger. Maybe it's some pain. Maybe it's something. When it comes to healing a broken world, a broken dream, a broken hope, a broken faith, you must release before you can receive. This is innovative forgiveness. Like my friend that day in church, there was a, it was a story that he'll never forget. He was so full of happiness and joy, and that is why he won't stop following Jesus. Now imagine if Peter and John would have just given this man a piece of bread only. What if they would have just given him some coins? Again, our task as Christians is to become blessings to all because that is some amazing, amazing harmony. The sin wasn't even, didn't, it didn't even come up. The sin didn't even come up. It wasn't even mentioned. You and I are just left just with question marks. What was it? The point is it didn't matter. It didn't stop a praise. It didn't stop a song. It didn't stop for the whole world to take note. That was the man that was sitting there hurt right at the temple gate. And that was the man that was out there and he was hurt by the church. Their sin, what he did, what he did, what you did, doesn't matter when it comes to praising Jesus. It doesn't matter to coming to get a healing. It doesn't matter because that was, he said, in the name of Jesus, stand up. I don't know nothing about you, but stand up and walk. The man was so excited. He couldn't stop singing. He couldn't stop praising. As we bring people together, our job is to be gentle. It's to be loving and to take everyone that has been forgotten and left outside of these walls and pick them up and let them dance again, let them worship again, and let them praise again. In Jesus' name, let us pray. Eternal God, we come to in the matchless name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this use, this use of your word to bring people hope and togetherness. Lord, I know that when we get to heaven, there isn't a black section, there isn't a white section. It's just a section for us all. We all get to be together. Lord, I love that we get to talk about belonging, forgiveness, unity, diversity, and we're talking and addressing a very touchy topic called church hurt. Lord, to anyone who's listening who's been hurt by the church, I ask that you would begin to teach them and pull on their heart about forgiveness, forgiving of themselves, releasing it, forgiving of other people, because that weight, I'm not asking them, Lord, to, to reconcile. I'm just saying that weight that's on them, start to get some of them bricks out of that backpack. Stop walking around with that anchor. That's the first step of forgiveness. And Lord, I thank you. And anyone under the sound of my voice, it's like, Lord, this is Jesus he's talking about. Can I have some of that? Lord, I ask that you would meet them right where they're at. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. September 13th, make sure you stay in the loop. September 13th, we're gathering here at 1130. We're going to be passing out. Get your church merch. We're going to pass out. Welcome back to church because it's coming. October 4th, we're getting back together. I'm so excited to be with you all, but stay masked up. Stay safe out there so it doesn't push this date back because I'm telling you, I, sore, I sorely miss seeing y'all. Now, I'm going to try to not hug because, you know, I'm a hugger, but I love y'all. And remember, I ask this all the time, give, give out of the abundance of your heart. Give what God can give you. I know times are hard. I know they are. But if this ministry is blessing you, I ask that you would give, that you would give of your time if you, when you have it and to give, that you would give of your resources and that you would give of your prayers because God is able to do exceeding and abundantly to all that we can ask or think. And as I always ask, may God bless your mind so that you can be a blessing to the whole body. God bless you. See you next week. The Collective, brought to you by FBC Sacramento, where diversity is our strength. At FBC Sacramento, we love that despite our differences, we can come together for purposes like spreading love into each of our communities through worship, praise, and togetherness. I hope your heart and your mind will be receptive to God's blessings throughout this year. I pray that you gain knowledge and wisdom and how to invest in God's principles such as diversity, inclusion, innovation, mental healthiness, and involvement. May God bless your mind so that you can be a blessing to the body. God bless.